So I'm really grateful to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very thankful to the Common Land Foundation and the Mustard Seed Trust, which make it possible for me to do this work. And it's a long story of how I got here. Um, it's uh, really um, about my position in observing transformational change. So I began my adult life as a journalist, as a cameraman, uh, taking pictures of the leaders in different parts of the world. But after encountering ecology, I shifted my, my life to focus on evolutionary succession. And I realized that we live in a massive universe and that throughout unbelievable expanses of time and space, and there's one planet that we know of within this enormous area which has an oxygenated atmosphere and a fresh water system and fertile soils and amazing biodiversity. And this is the planet which we, we live on. And I, I, when I started to study this, I, I realized that actually when the earth formed, it didn't have an oxygenated atmosphere, a fresh water system. And it was not the beautiful biodiverse system that, that uh, we experience. And as I, as I began to understand, it's a biochemical photoreactive process that over really enormous time, 3.8 billion years of, of, of life on earth has created, constantly filtered, and continuously renewed the, the systems that we depend on for life. And that humans actually don't appear in this scenario until much later when, when there's a, a, a wonderful system. And in the scientific community, it's often discussed as, um, as uh, shifting baselines. So if we are born and we come out and take a look at what we see around us, it sort of depends on what we see. And the climax equilibrium that emerged over evolutionary time is amazing but humans have of, often focused on what we could build and what we understood by extracting and manufacturing things and we put a value on that and we've said that this is the basis of wealth and this is the basis of money the fashioning of the material things and there is very little evidence that this is true <laughs> because all of the things which we extract and manufacture emerge from what exists. This is simply a cat video so that you'll like me. Uh, the, the, these are cheetahs who, who are nursing in the wild. Um, if you get a chance to go to Maasai Mara, it's it's amazing but essentially what <clears throat> i began to understand was that the wealth the health the life support systems on the planet are not made by man and that 
by extracting, <clears throat> manufacturing, and buying and selling things, what we were doing was we were creating derivatives. And we were saying that these derivatives were more valuable than the system that gives us life. And this is not true. <clears throat> so we have a fundamental mistake in logic at the core of our, of our reasoning. And that unless we understand this as a society and as a civilization, we will not get a different result. Now, I wanted to show you that the Earth 3.8 billion years ago was not the same as the Earth today. And that we know that this is um, electron microscopic things. And I see a, a colleague I met recently from Sydney University, and he was talking about the aggregates in soil. These are filamentous fungi that exude polysaccharide sheaths and spread out, and they aggregate the soil together. And without this, you, you, you don't have soil structure. And when you don't have soil structure, you don't have the pores which allow the moisture to infiltrate and be retained. And when, when we understand the complexity of this system, and we understand that it was self-organizing, self-replicating, and took place over a very, very long time and led to a climax equilibrium in which, in which human beings could emerge, then we have to consider what is the role of humans from the perspective of evolutionary traits. And I would say that it seems that we're supposed to be conscious. We're supposed to have um, the ability to use our quite complex brains to analyze, and we're supposed to use language ability to, to explain what, what is happening. And what I found was that the, the power of these natural systems is the basis not only of biodiversity, well, there are three systems that I found, and I, I found 30 some, but my advisors told me it's too complicated. <laughs> Make it more simple. So I tried to reduce this to three, and I found that biodiversity, biomass, and necromass, or accumulated organic material, as each generation of life dies and gives up its body, these are the the basis of the systems, the many systems, and they create constantly filter and continuously renew the oxygenated atmosphere and the freshwater system and the fertile soils. They also regulate hydrology, weather, and climate. So what I started to realize was that the biological life self-organized to alter the physics on the planet. And if we look at that earlier picture of the planet, we realize that it was more like Mars or the moon, but with an oxygenated atmosphere, with a high canopy, and with all this vegetation and organic material, it's processing all of the systems. And so what this does is that it holds moisture. It changes the surface temperatures, and it changes the surface temperatures by huge amounts. If anyone wants to discuss this, I'm keen to talk about the, the, the temperature differentials that I've found, which can be as high. The highest I've found are 45 degrees centigrade between sands in shifting sand deserts and below artificially created vegetation. 
which is 25 from 70 degrees centigrade on the sand to 25 degrees below the vegetation. So when we think about 1.5 to 2 degrees in temperature averages, and we want to affect these temperature averages, we need to consider this. And I also found that the biodiversity, the amazing changes in, in the biodiversity, that in nature, you can't really remove anything. Because if you remove something, you alter the system. And so when I was a journalist and going around, I was looking at the politicians and the economics and the cultural issues. And I found that when you look at these issues, they are short-term issues. They're important for the people that are experiencing them. But in terms of the longer arc of life, it's, there, there's a different level of relevance. It's another dimension of thinking. I think in India, they call it Maya. It's kind of a, an illusion. It's a very, I mean, our, this building seems very solid and so on. But if you are thinking in terms of thousands or, or millions or billions of years, it's, it's a thing and it's going, to, it's going to crumble. And what we need to realize is we are part of a very long system. And this long system, we are one generation in this very long system. And so we shouldn't be really just thinking of ourselves as individuals. We should be thinking of ourselves as part of a, of a species. And it is our social ability, our ability to act as a species on a planetary scale, which has made humans quite dangerous, but also very powerful and why we're calling this the Anthropocene. Now, this is where I started to study in the Luz Plateau about 30 years ago. I was asked by the World Bank to document the largest restoration program. Now, the Luz Plateau is the cradle of Chinese civilization. So it's the, it's the place where the Han race and many, many other races emerged. And this is to the southwest in Sichuan, fully functional system. And this is what it looked like in the Luz Plateau when I got there in 1994. So this was known as the most eroded place on Earth. It had been studied for quite a long time, so there's quite a lot of data. And knowing that it was the cradle of civilization for the Chinese race, and I'm partly Chinese, I realized my ancestors came from this place. Now, I hope the audio is working. Um, on the, is the audio working coming through here? If, if you can bring up the audio for this. Um, if it's not on, we'll know this. In now, when we came to this okay, place, so it's not on, the plateau the first it? time, we were all really shocked. You know, we thought, oh my God, really you know, well, how can, how can ever thought, anybody oh try to rehabilitate I think it's an coming area out that is so huge and so fundamentally destroyed ecologically? And so fundamentally and the truth is we spent two years ecologically. working with the local people, and with the, the farmers, is we spent the local two officials, years with, with the, the experts in the various fields of hydrology, soil and water conservation, forestry, agriculture, environment, try to understand what it would take environment to do something like that. Try to understand and after what two years, we still didn't have many answers. Like the World Bank didn't have the answer. And after two and years, we still didn't have many answers. answers. And we spent another year and a half talking to the farmers in the village. We spent another year and a half what talking they to had the farmers in the village in the past 20 or 30 years that was successful. What they had done in the past 20 or 30 years. And it was really interesting. Not much was there to show. And it was because really interesting. The current practices at that time was there to show. were just because not sustainable. The current at all. practices at that time were just not sustainable at all. So essentially, everything that they were doing 
was harmful. <laughs> and they were cutting trees and they were farming on the sides of slopes and there were free ranging goats and sheep. And when the scientists analyzed what were the causes of this, it was tree cutting, <laughs> planting on the slopes and free ranging of goats and sheep. And it totally disrupted the hydrological infiltration and retention, which is quite important. I think it was one of the first things that I noticed. And of course, Lus is a, is a um, geomorphological name of the, of the soil type and it's caused by the movements of glaciers, which create a very fine powder. Um, and it's very prone to erosion. But if it has those aggregates that hold it together, it's very fertile, it's minerally rich. And this is the basis of flooding. And this is the basis of drought, which is the other side of flooding. Because if the floods come, then all the water is lost and it doesn't infiltrate and it's not retained and then you have drought and it's the basis of the dust storms which we've also heard are affecting this region and so all of these things were happening and when i looked at this and i compared it to the political stories or the cultural or economic stories i realized that this was where i wanted to spend the rest of my life and I realized that this is actually in, in the early, early 2000s in Ethiopia. So slash and burn is still going on in many parts of the world, but it leads to a trajectory which is always less biodiversity, always less biomass and always less accumulated organic matter. And ultimately that is collapse of the system. And when I saw this, I, I was thinking that this is actually a, the precedent of agriculture is leading to this. So we think that the, by commoditizing food, we're creating wealth, but actually we're creating poverty. We're creating a, an infinite system that was self-replicating and we're turning it into a finite linear system, which collapses. And every civilization which went in this direction had the same result. So we're re repeating history over and over. This is what they do every time I go to the Bliss Plateau. I don't know. I, I don't like it anymore. But they come and, 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 and do this because they're excited by what they've been able to achieve. And when they started this, they just made everything that the people were doing illegal. They said, we're very sorry, but you can't cut trees, you can't plant on the sides of hills, and you can't free range goats and sheep. And as they did this, they realized that they would have to train the people to do something else. And so they had meetings and they discussed with them, well, we're gonna, you're gonna be kind, become restorationists. They did something else which was quite useful, they paid them. So that works well as well. Um, but finally, the people understood it because their, their habits, habitual behaviors were replaced with new habitual behaviors. And the goal was to give a hat to the hilltops, give a belt to the hills, as well as shoes at the base. The hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. The belt meant that terraces had to be built, to be used for crop planting, and also for trees. The shoes were the dams which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy as well as our lives could improve.
When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. The results were dramatic. And essentially, they have a, a tremendous amount of, of strange understandings. It's possible to rehydrate dehydrated biomes. It's possible to increase productivity by reducing the area in cultivation. <laughs> um, and that all of these systems are fully interrelated. So you can't separate and remove things and expect to have a functional system. You have to understand that soil carbon is important, but it's, it's basically all of the systems are important because they're all part of a whole. So you can't really separate out one thing or another, you have to have them all. And people are important too. So we have been making things into materialism. We need to realize that people are, are important to the system as well. And that people can be the agents of change, not simply the, the degradation. Now, Common Land Foundation was founded. I gave a speech a long time ago in, in Sweden, and the founder of Common Land was there, and I see Helmi in the back, which we also work with Sekim in Egypt, which is a wonderful program there. But Common Land is aggregating large land owners and also uh, farmers and investment to do large-scale ecosystem restoration. So they have a very effective team and are leading in, in many ways to bring together the theory and the practice, because this is not a theoretical problem. <laughs> this is a physical problem where we must act to restore the, the ecological function and to understand that that's based on biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter. So all over the world now, common land is influencing and they have certain core areas where they're participating in the, in the creation of large scale food processing of large scale restoration, reforestation, natural zones, and agroecology. So this is all becoming very systematic. There's a term, the four returns that they're working on, which is the return of inspiration, the return of societal cohesion, the return of natural uh, capital. And then from that, a return on investment. And then I've also founded something called the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Movement. I was having dreams. And in these dreams, people were going camping and restoring the soil. And I, I shook my head and said, well, that's never going to happen. But I wrote an essay and tens of thousands of people said, that's what we want. So we created foundations in this movement. Now there's 65 of these communities in six continents in six years. So 
that's exponential growth and it could become huge. We hope you'll all join in this effort. And I hope that we can join with four per 1000 to take the message of soil carbon all over the world and use these living laboratories to be able to experiment where people are learning. And what we're finding is that if you do this work, you're having fun. And if you do this work, you can react to some of the most serious problems on the planet. So the first camp and community that we had was in Paradise, California, where 85 people were killed by a massive fire. And the people in California went out to restore that landscape. We're all over, working now all over the world. So it's not only in this place or that place, we're seeing that it's not culturally specific. We can work everywhere because people are ready for this. And when you do this, you change the power dynamic from the top down to the bottom up. And the people are empowered and they have rights. They have a birthright and they, their rights should not be determined by whether they have money. We should ask, why have they lost their rights? Not, do they have rights? And what we're seeing is everyone can learn how to do this. And in doing this, they can make their own families and their communities more resilient. They can end food insecurity and they're the most important people in the world because they're addressing directly, instantly, not the 28th meeting of a political conceptual idea, but actually every day with their own actions, increasing biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, sequestering carbon in the soil, restoring fertility, restoring hydrological regulation, and ensuring food security and and uh, peace. So ultimately, this brings all of the things that we're facing together, just as it is in ecology, that we can't separate one thing and say, we're going to do deal with this, but we have all these other problems which are taking place. We have to solve them all. And ecological restoration with mass collaboration and mass participation solves all of the problems simultaneously. And we have to do this locally, but simultaneously we have to do this everywhere on the planet simultaneously, and we have to do it now. So it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you and hope I have made sense. And um, please contact me if you wish to, and we can have this conversation again and again and again, because I've noticed over the last 30 years that very slowly it starts to catch on. I see uh, several friends who, who are arriving who came at different times in this journey, and uh, they've had a huge impact on the world. So we need to continue that. So thank you very much for, uh, and I'm happy to speak to anybody who wants to find me. Thank you so much. Thank you again to the organizers.